Thank you, and um, I would like to thank the organizers for this uh, workshop. It's uh, a very exciting topic and really, uh, I think, a very timely topic as well. And what we have now in machine learning really needs some sort of understanding from the point of view of approximation. And another thing which is closely related, if I'll talk a little bit about in the talk, is optimization. Uh, so what uh, I would like to talk about today is, uh, is to take a perspective of modern machine learning from the interpolation point of view, and I'll explain what that means in a second. And I think it uh, actually fits quite nicely with the very nice talk that Paul just gave, uh, the previous talk. And Basically, we will see that there are some um, quite interesting phenomena in uh, modern data analysis or modern machine learning which really require an explanation. And if we understand them, I, I think we can make tremendous progress. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is, uh, uh, will be based on joint work with uh, my students, Si Yuan Ma and Sumik Mandal. Uh, and in particular, Si Yuan has done a lot of work on this. And my colleagues, Raif Basile, Daniel Su, Partemitra, Sasha Raklin, and uh, Sasha uh, Tsibakov. So uh, let's first start with kind of, well, so what we have seen recently is machine learning really becoming a backbone for a lot of commercial and societal activities that we have. You know, there are all sorts of things, self-driving cars and, you know, various data analysis tasks, all sorts of things. But how, how does it work? I mean, a lot of things that we have now, like, say, self-driving cars or, you know, complications to computer visions, they're based on, you know, structures like this. This is a typical neural net structure. And effectively, well, you can think about it. Well, what is the thing? Well, this defines a function class. Right? This uh, neural network architecture is basically a function class. But as you can see, this is a very complex function class. And in fact, well, this is far from the most complex neural networks that we have now. But that's kind of one which makes a nice picture. So, well, if you look at it, well, how can we understand something like that? And we probably cannot understand this thing specifically. This is just too complex. And maybe some of the complexity is unnecessary. So on one hand side, we get this amazing result. On the other hand side, there is this kind of, you, maybe you call it the fog of war, is that in the excitement of progress, we may not be able to identify things which are really key. And, you know, as um, sort of scientists, we need to isolate and analyze I components of what contributes to the success of modern machine learning. That way we can make progress. Uh, now, uh, well, what are some of those components? So I, I would like to talk about what I think is one of the components and something which uh, I have recently been working. And before I discuss that, let me first, just to make sure we're on the same page, give a very brief introduction to machine learning. So that's like one slide introduction to machine learning. Uh, what, what, what do we have? We have data, xi, yi. xi are features, and they're in some sort of d-dimensional space. Yi are labels for simplicity. I'm just taking to be binary labels minus one and one. You know, you can think of image classification type, for example. You know, cat or dog. <laughs> now, uh, what's a goal? The goal is to construct a function from Rd to R, given this kind of input, that generalizes to unseen data. And what does it mean? It generalizes that you mean I give you a bunch of examples of cats or dogs and you want to construct a function on images that given a new image decides whether it's a cat or dog. And you can see it's a kind of a weird problem because you want to generalize to something which you can have not seen before, right? So you have to make some assumptions if you want to analyze it. Now, uh, how do most algorithms, most modern algorithms for machine learning or 
work, they use something called empirical risk minimization. And what you do, you construct this empirical risk function. And what this empirical risk function is, is simply, let's just say, the square loss, to make it simple. So you take your function, you compare the output on xi to yi, and you take the average of that over all of your data points. So that's, you know, just you can think of it as a regression problem. And then you take the minimum over some function class h of that quantity, okay? Now, how do you actually do it? You optimize this using stochastic gradient descent. And this is uh, kind of ubiquitous in modern machine learning that stochastic gradient descent is used. And uh, really nothing else is used, at least for big data sets. When I say stochastic gradient descent, there are many variants of it. But I'll actually talk a little bit about stochastic gradient descent specifically. So bear with me on this point. OK, so that, that's kind of all of machine learning, right? Now f is in some sort of neural network. You plug this in, you optimize. All right, so now, OK, I said the word interpolation. And um, of course, I'm sure everybody knows it. But again, just to make sure we're on the same page, to me, interpolation is simply the following. as well, classical notion of interpolation. You just throw this on my data. This, uh, you know, my feature is x. And the output is 1 or minus 1. Interpolation is simply a function which goes through the data points. And in practice, people often use not the square, not, not, so this would be like the zero square loss. But you can use maybe some other loss. And you can kind of think that, well, you can do something similar to interpolation, but only preserving the sign of each data point. So for classification, that's what you care about. So that's kind of, I'll call it also interpolation, but it's a little bit weaker than true interpolation. Maybe you can call it zero loss fitting if you would like. OK. So now, um, what is the intuition that we have about interpolation? And the kind of typical intuition we have in, you know, like machine learning statistics if you, is that, OK, interpolation is not really that useful for machine learning or for real data analysis, because somehow it overfits the data. And uh, yeah, Paul actually mentioned this overfit term, which has different meaning to different people. And you know, this would be somehow a typical representation of that notion. Uh, this is from this book on uh, non-parametric regression. Uh, so the left graph shows interpolation, and the right one shows somehow correct regression. And the argument is the estimate on the right seems to be more reasonable than the estimate on the left, which interpolates the data. So somehow interpolating the data doesn't seem to be reasonable from the point of view of the authors of this book, uh, which is you know, widely shared uh, sort of idea. OK. What, uh, so that's a kind of uh, intuition, but let, let's look at the practice of this. And, you know, I kind of title it, you know, who is afraid of overfitting? <laughs> and he, here is an actual example. So this are train accuracy, and this is test accuracy on CIFAR 10, which is some sort of image data set. And this is from this paper, Understanding Deep Learning Requires Rethinking Generalization by Zhang et al. And they, they train a neural network conception. It's some sort of standard neural net. And what you see is that you train to have accuracy 100%, right? So that's interpolation, at least in the this weaker notion of interpolation. And you have very good test accuracy, right? You get about 90, close to 90% test accuracy, which is not exactly state of the art, but not too far. So that's. Um, Pretty striking, right? You basically you don't see any overfitting whatsoever here, or well, may, maybe extremely small amount. Now uh, you can kind of take it, uh, sort of take a more systematic approach in this, and um, look at the tutorial on deep learning from Ruslan Salukdinov, who gave uh, this tutorial at the Simons Institute last year, and he here is what he said. He said. 
Basically, you want to make sure you hit zero training error. So the first thing you do, you take your huge neural net, you hit zero training error, that's the first thing, and then maybe you tune the parameters a little bit to kind of optimize the test a little bit. But, but that's basically the first thing you do, okay? So it somehow doesn't completely square with the previous picture, right? That the interpolation was not sort of reasonable. And let me show you one more uh, sort of picture, which is somehow what we think about, this is, a, this is probably a picture, you know, if you, if you take or teach, you know, a statistics class or machine learning class, you probably see something like this. So you model complexity as your model complexity increases. Your training error goes down because you have more and more functions, so you can fit better. But your test error or validation error, whatever you call it, goes down and then it goes back up again. I hope you can see it's kind of, uh, this green doesn't come across very well. Okay, that's a very typical, that's a very typical picture. Bias variance trade-off. Uh, now what is actually happening in practice? And th this is in fact, uh, this is um, a specific data. This is MNIST, which is a digit data set is what is happening is, as you're training the model, and the model actually the kernel machine in this case, it's an RBF network. As you're training the model, as you train it more and more, you have bigger and bigger space of set of parameters available to you, so your model complexity actually increases with training. Your zero on train goes to, to, to zero, like up, goes up to 10 to the minus five. And what happens on the test error, you go down and that's it, you never go up. Now you can do actually even more here because this is not a neural network, this is a kernel machine. And a kernel machine of, of this type has an analytic solution. So I can just do it by matrix inversion. And if I do it by matrix inversion, I feed my training data exactly up to, you know, basically numerical precision, 10 to the minus 27. So that's true interpolation, as true as it can be in a computer. And look at the test error for that interpolating classifier. It's basically the same. So by doing exact interpolation, I have lost absolutely nothing in terms of the test error. And you can do this on a bunch of, oh, you cannot really see anything. Uh, in any case, we did this on a bunch of different data sets the results are very consistent. You either lose nothing by doing exact interpolation or you lose very little. So it's very consistent with that other picture. Okay, now, is this a new phenomenon? Well, actually, it turns out that it's not exactly a new phenomenon. In fact, it's kind of not a new phenomenon. And so for in deep neural networks, it has been observed recently, but also much earlier. As, as long ago as 20 years ago. And we, we observed it for kernel machines, but also it has been observed for kernel machines before. Uh, random forest, similar things, other boosts. So there are all sorts of things which are known to perform very well on test when your training loss is zero. And I should say that uh, interpolation is not always recognized as such because regularization with very small lambda is effectively interpolation. But, you know, not necessarily register as such, when you, you can take like regularization with say 10 to the minus seven lambda, that's effectively fitting your data exactly. Uh, okay, so that's uh, kind of uh, the um, unusual thing, uh, the unusual phenomenon, and you may think, well, why is this important? And the next thing I am going to, oh, and I should say, I really should point out this uh, very nice uh, short paper by Leo Bryman, who is a very well-known statistician who, from Berkeley who passed away about 10 years ago. He did uh, uh, begging and he did uh, cart, uh, the, tr the trees, three methods, and um, that was his from his paper from 95, Reflections After Referring Papers for NIPs, okay? Uh, and he said, well, why don't heavily parameterized networks overfit the data? What is the effective number of parameters? Why doesn't backpropagation head for poor local minimum? And when 
should we stop back propagation and use current parameters? Okay, that's a basically the questions we're asking now. So clearly, there is a long history to that. And now I think we actually have at least some answers over that. So okay, so now now there are two questions, and I'll try to give at least partial answers to these questions. First is why do interpolating classifiers generalize? And the second question is, why interpolate at all, right? Because, okay, I, I showed you some sort of phenomenon, and you may say, okay, it's kind of weird, but why, why do we care? And let me first start with the first one. And the first one is that, well, do we have theory? And I first would like to point out that really not so much help from the existing theory. There is a little bit, but very, very limited amount. And I'll show some theory that we developed, which kind of may take a step toward explaining it. So that's the first. And then the second, I'll point out that optimization actually, so inter interpolation has this very positive effect, and perhaps unexpected positive effect on optimization. And that's probably why interpolation is so common now in things like neural networks. And in fact, once you realize that you can use that to make things like kernel machines much faster. So, okay, let me start now with the first, which is um, why somehow our current theory comes short. And that's, I think, where really there is a lot of scope for th trying to develop theoretical understanding, because we really need to understand different aspects. So it's statistical aspect interpolation, you know, is approximation. So we need to understand the properties of these function spaces. And of course, we would like to understand the connection to the method that we have now, the neural networks. OK, so that's the kind of problem, right? The theory should say that as we train more, it should go up. In practice, this curve never goes up. It only goes down. So what's going on? Well, you can kind of think, OK, well, let's try to look at the most common analysis for machine learning type of methods for specifically empirical risk minimization. And basically, the most common analysis goes something like this. Uh, so remember, empirical risk minimization, we are minimizing the loss over some space of functions. And we would like to somehow predict somehow the future. And what is the future? Assuming my data is sampled from some underlying probability distribution, the future is some sort of expected loss, right? It's expected loss on my data. And the typical bound goes like this. Expected loss is less or equal than empirical loss, which is the quantity we are minimizing, plus some term. And what is this term? It's roughly of the form square root of c over n. And here c is some measure of complexity for the function class we're minimizing over. And for example, it can be something like uh, vc dimension or covering numbers. There are, there are many of these types of bounds. There are you know, probably like thousands of papers with bounds of this type. By the way, if there are any questions, I'm more than happy to, you know, answer or clarify. Can you just yeah. Say, so for different backgrounds, can you just say what you mean by kernel machine? For kernel machine, I just mean radial. Um, I actually will have. I'll discuss this a little bit. But um, to me, kernel machine is just radial RBF network. Okay. You just put the Gaussian kernels and you fit that. It's exactly what Paul had in the previous slide. Just a different name for that. OK, well, OK, he, here we go, right? Different communities <laughs> have different names for the same thing. I call it kernel machines, you know, <laughs> which machines, that's cool. <laughs> OK, so that, that's a kind of typical bound, right? And well, believe me if you haven't seen that. Um, now, let's think about what happens in the interpolated regime. So when you have interpolation, we have zero empirical loss. So that terms disappear. And what we need, we need to bound this one by that. right? So expected loss by something like square root of c over n. And it's not completely impossible. It looks kind of difficult, but actually it's not generally impossible. But let's see whether this bound can be useful. So let me show 
a little bit of uh, discussion. And, you know, the question is, well, what kind of model complexity of interpolation is? And what do I mean by model complexity? Well, if my data, for example, are linearly separable, I need something like a line to separate it, and there are not that many lines, right? The complexity of the space of lines is not too high. And there are many classical results available, um, for example, margin bounds, such as Shapiro et al. Now, the alternative is that my data is kind of messy. And if I want to interpolate it, I need something like that. And the complexity of that is really high, and we don't have much for that. So let's see what actual, so I showed you some results on real data, but you don't know whether real data is like this, or it is like that, right? So let's see how we can test this. Well, one, the, one way to test it is to just construct the data artificially, take some synthetic data. Another way to test it is take some data and just add label noise. What do I mean by that? You just flip some of the labels, okay? I flip this two, I make them blue, and I flip that one to make it red, and now clearly that the complexity of the model which has zero loss must be <coughs> quite high here because you have to somehow separate that point and so on. So let's see what happens when the model complexity grows. So notice that the optimal separator is still this line, but the interpolating separator is crazy. And if there is some sort of overfitting, we expect it to become very severe as model complexity grows. Well, let's see. Uh, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to, uh, maybe you can look at this one. So I just take MNIST, which is a standard data set, and I'm adding label noise, so I'm flipping more and more labels. And the green line is a base optimal classifier, so that's the best possible classifier. Well, actually, I don't exactly know, it's a lower bound on that, but we can just think that this is the best possible classifier. And the red one is interpolation using this kernel method. And what you can see that even for 60% noise, interpolation basically gives me a result which is extremely similar to the base optimal within like 2 or 3%. So independently of my noise label, so I'm flipping more and more labels. So of course, my error gets worse because you know those labels are unpredictable since I'm flipping them at random. But the kernel machine, or whatever, I think we will get the same thing with a neural network, actually just tracks the optimal. It's just slightly worse than the optimal. If, you, if I use a different one, it's slightly worse, but it's still pretty good. Up to like 80% label noise, which is, you know, kind of insane. Now, uh, what does it mean? That means that we would, if we have a generalization bound of that form we had before, we would like it to be correct, but also non-trivial. So if it's more, this is a 10 class classifier, so if it's more than 0.9, this is trivial because that's worse than random. You can just do a random guess if it's worse than 0.9. If it's less than 0.7, it's better than the base optimal classifier. That's impossible, that's wrong. So to be correct and to be non-trivial, this quantity has to be in between 0.7 and 0.9. And here is kind of the, the issue, is that there are actually no bounds like this. Uh, not to say that they don't exist, I don't know. I tried to prove that they don't exist, I couldn't quite prove it. But they're certainly not known. And I suspect, personally, that they don't exist. Um, so, basically, the existing analysis completely, at least that type of analysis, completely fails. So that's um, kind of the bad news in some sense. And you can now, well, okay, well, do, do we have some good news? Well, yes. And there is, um, actually, if you think about it, most analysis, in fact, fail in this. And in particular, things like regularization, like Tikhon of type analysis, also fail. And other types of analysis fail, too, because all the bounds for, say, Tikhon of depend on this regularization parameters. But, I'll. but there is something, um, kind of interesting, which doesn't completely fail, although it is very obscure. And in fact, we found this paper by DeVroy et al. from 98, which makes this point for a very special um, estimation scheme. 
it has like 10 citations, this paper, uh, and showing that certain things may not fail. And, but let me point out that um, he, here is the interesting thing. Imagine I'm just doing one nearest neighbor classifier, okay? So that's a really simple classifier. For every point, I just find its nearest neighbor and I assign the label for that nearest neighbor to that point. So that's not a great classifier. It makes mistakes. And it's um, kind of far from the base optimum, from the best possible one. But it's um, not too far. It's at worst twice the base optimal. And moreover, what is interesting about it is that it is an interpolating classifier, right? Because each point gets its own label. And we don't need margin assumptions, we don't need uniform bounds, and so on. I just directly estimate the gap. So let me now point out something like that, which uh, you can do, and it's much better than what you're a stable. And, um, and here is the idea. So imagine I have these four points. Uh, sorry, that's five. I cannot count. Uh, and you, you know, suppose these four points are red, and this is blue. And so red maybe you think of being one, and blue is being uh, minus one. And uh, what? Oh, what's going on? And what you do here? Here is the algorithm. You just triangulate this. And then you linearly interpolate this on each of the triangles, OK? So because I'm giving values, there is a unique linear function which fits up. And then I just threshold. And you know, if this is 1 and this is minus 1, then I just threshold at 0 here. So that's a really simple mechanism. Now I'm going to classify all points here as blue, and all points outside as red. And my claim is that this is actually very close to the optimal classifier. And in fact, you can prove that this is within um, the d-dimensional version of that is actually uh, has something like 1 plus 1 over 2 to the d times a base risk. So in high dimension, this is nearly optimal given enough data. It's a, some sort of asymptotic result. So you have, interestingly enough, some sort of blessing of dimensionality. So at the very least, it shows that things are possible. And maybe in high dimension, in some sense, this interpolating method is actually better than the non-interpolating ones. And in fact, there are this, uh, this is related to that paper by DeVroy. There are some uh, schemes using singular kernels, which look really weird, like that, which can be shown to be statistically optimal bizarrely enough, in some sort of minimax sense, which I don't want to go into. OK. But you, you can kind of say, OK, this is all pretty weird stuff. You know, yeah, maybe this is statistically optimal if you get like 10 to the 100 data points, but we don't have that many. Maybe that's. Um, how, how does it actually connect to things which we do, which is, say, neural networks or kernel machines and things like that. And that, I think, is still a big open question, because they're clearly not the schemes of this type. But maybe a little bit like this. Maybe a little bit like that. But OK. Now, uh, let me kind of switch gears. And at the very least, this shows that this is not so crazy to have something which is statistically good and interpolate the data. But let me now tell you why interpolation actually is a great idea. So this, this was kind of showing, OK, interpolation maybe is not a terrible idea. But why is it a great idea? Well, let's think about what happens with optimization. And optimization, as I said before, basically, well, we can think of optimization as finding the value of, of parameters which minimize this empirical loss. I am writing it in this form, but you can kind of think. This is f w of x i minus y i, and w are the parameters, say, you know, weights of a neural net. Now, uh, how does stochastic gradient descent work? So, well, this is a function of w, so you can obviously do gradient descent, and that's kind of a natural thing to do if you don't know anything, you know, better than that. But people use stochastic gradient descent. And how does stochastic gradient descent work? Well, you just optimize the sum, but you don't optimize it all at once. 
you just optimize it one at a time. Oh, in practice, it's done by a mini batch. So you choose, say, 100 terms from this. So maybe you have 1 million data points. So this sum is 1 million terms long. You take 100 out of them, take that sum, and do gradient step for that sum. So compute gradient, do gradient step, then take the next 100, do gradient step for that one. Just keep repeating, OK? Here is the interesting thing that uh, what you can show is that after t steps, stochastic gradient descent can register at a rate of 1 over t. This is kind of classical result. Now, gradient descent converges at a rate which is uh, exponential, or called linear in optimization. Well, again, exponential rate is called linear in optimization. <laughs> <laughs> and this is sublinear. Uh, and it converges uh, at this rate, which is exponential in t. And obviously, this is like infinitely better than that one. Why would anybody use this when you can use that? And so why do people actually use SGD? And when I say people use SGD, I should qualify this a little bit. People use versions of SGD, which are really this kind of momentum-based techniques. But I, let, let me, uh, like Nestor of type. But le, let me sort of uh, skip that point. It's not super important at this moment. Um, OK, so what's going on here? Why not use this one, right? All major neural network architectures use SGD. So let me actually show that SGD is good, if you believe in interpolation. And let's just consider this super simple example. So imagine my parameter is W, and my loss function has this form. I mean, this is a, you know, it's just the sum of these two terms. W times 1 minus 1, and W times 1 plus 1. So you can think of this being a loss, and W being the parameter. And this, of course, non-interpolation in the sense that there is no W such that this and that can become 0 simultaneously, right? Because W means that you must fit every point. So if you do SGD here, what is going to happen? If you do SGD here, well, think about it. This will pull your w to the right to 1, and then you take a gradient descent with respect to this term, that will go left, right? So if you apply stochastic gradient descent here by alternating these two terms, you will actually oscillate, and you will never converge. I hope this is clear. This is a very, um, the simplest pro probably example of that. Because I'm just doing gradient descent with respect to w, but I'm alternating those two terms. And that results in no convergence at all. It just results in oscillation. Now, if I wanted to oscillate, I can do different tricks. I can decrease the step size, or I can average them. And then you can force them to converge. But the convergence will be very slow. If you use full gradient descent, of course, you optimize with respect to both of them simultaneously. And you converge at the usual e to the minus something rate. OK, good. So now. Uh, SGD oscillates, adaptive step size is required. Now imagine I make this into an interpolated problem. Of course, I have to change this a little bit, but I change it very slightly. So suppose now I have two variables, w1 and w2. And now, of course, there is a solution which minimizes both of them at the same time. So that's the interpolation. And this is simply w1 equals 1 and w2 equals minus 1. Now if I'm claiming that for this solution, you get exponential rate for stochastic gradient descent. And that's kind of obvious in this case because, well, stochastic gradient descent here means that you first do gradient descent with respect to W1 and then to respect to W2. And see, if those guys are uncoupled, you will converge very quickly with respect to each. And therefore, you will converge to the optimal solution at an exponential rate. So you don't need adaptive state size. You don't need any averaging. And you get exponential convergence for free. OK. Well, so that's basically the idea. And what you can prove, and maybe I will not go over the details of this, but basically you can prove that this is generally true for something like something very similar to that. It's generally true for arbitrary, uh, well, convex in this case, it's for convex functions, so for convex losses.
you have some sort of exponential convergence. Okay, and that's um, that's interesting because that actually shows that in some sense the interpolated regime is very different from non-interpolated one, since algorithms like stochastic gradient descent really have different properties. Now. Let me be a little bit more specific because I think the, the, the details here are kind of interesting. And let me describe what is happening here with respect to the mini batch size. And so remember, mini batch size is just how many of these terms I'm taking at once. Now, uh, what is happening is that there is some sort of mini batch size which we call, we call it like critical or optimal mini batch size. And it turns out that basically you have linear scaling up to this mini batch size. And that linear scaling, what makes it linear? It's basically that if you take mini batch of size 2, so one step of mini batch of size 2 is kind of equivalent to two steps of mini batch of size 1. That's why it's linear. And it goes like that up to m star, so one step of one iteration of mini batch size m star is equivalent to m star iteration of mini batch size one. Okay? And beyond that, you get saturation in that you don't get anything more. And in fact, one, one step of mini batch size m star is actually equivalent up to a small constant, which is like four or something like that, to a full gradient descent. So you don't have to do gradient descent. You just need to figure out what m star is and take a mini batch of that size, and that's it. That's equivalent. Well, maybe you need to take like four steps of that. So that means that potentially you have all of n computational gain over gradient descent, depending on what this critical size is. And the interesting thing, at least for uh, a quadra so for this is for a quadratic loss function. You, m star is approximately equal to trace of h divided by lambda 1 of h when h is a Hessian. And so trace is just a trace, and lambda 1 is the top eigenvalue of the Hessian. So that's pretty neat, because why? Well, this is uh, not exactly data independent, but it's close to being data independent. And therefore, m star really doesn't depend so much on how many data points you have. So you can get a big, big saving. I'll actually say something a little bit more about that in one of the next slides. Now, um, why do mini batch at all? And you can ask about, you know, the kind of basic premise here. Why do we want to do mini batch? We want to do mini batch for the following reason. Well, and if you look here, right, M star mini batches of size 1 is the same as 1 mini batch of star, oh, I'm sorry, of the size m star. So it seems, and think about from the computational point of view, they're the same. So there is no gain if you actually think about a sequential machine. But if you think about a parallel machine, there is a big gain, because think about a parallel machine, right? A parallel machine maybe can do a full mini batch all at once. And that's exactly what we have. A GPU is basically a parallel machine which can do a mini batch at once. It's not completely true, but it's close to being true, at least for small mini batch sizes. If you actually time that, you'll see that mini batch of size 1 and mini batch of size, uh, I think, up to something like 128 basically takes almost the same time. Like, it's very close to being true for small mini batch sizes. Uh, and, you know, this is actually a, a GPU, a modern kind of schematic of a modern GPU. This tiny thing, this, oh, I'm sorry. Um, these tiny green things are actually little processors. And what it takes, it takes this matrix, and if you want to do an operation like matrix vector multiplication, it kind of spreads it around those green tiny little dots, and it does all at once. So the fact is, the reason we like mini batches is actually because of that, or at least mini batches of size more than one. And in fact, you can think that, well, this is, I, I think that the kind of, it may look like a very technical kind of hardware issue, but I think there is actually something really fundamental going on here. Is that we have this 
kind of amazing modern hardware. And th these things are amazing. They have like uh, modern modern GPU does 10 teraflops, which is 10 uh, trillion operations per second, which is absolutely unbelievable speed. Uh, and if you cannot have an algorithm which maps, but they, they are not universal machines. They do very special operations, like matrix vector <coughs> multiplication type of things. If your algorithm or your data analysis or whatever you're using doesn't map onto this, it's not going to be scalable to modern data. So really what we need to do, at least if we're interested in dealing with data and using it for machine learning type of tasks, we have to make sure that our algorithm mostly map onto that. So some small parts of them don't have to map, but the kind of time-consuming parts must map onto these machines, otherwise they will never be competitive. So in some sense, we should look at a different computational paradigm. Paradigm sort of given by this, by, by, by this uh, Titan X GPU. Okay, so now let's kind of take a step back and think about modern machine learning. And the kind of question is, well, suppose I just tell you, ah, I would like to interpolate something. And suppose I just have a linear system of equations. Well, how would you interpolate? Well, when can you have an interpolating solution? So interpolating solution in this case is simply a solution such that Ax is equal to b, right? For, for solving a system of linear equation is just to make sure that you have more variables that rank a is bigger than n. Right? That's, that's all we need. That would be interpolation. If it's smaller than n, then we cannot interpolate. We have to somehow do some sort of fitting. Uh, well, how would you do it? Well, you just increase the number of variables if you want to interpolate. So you just throw more variables at it. And well, basically, how does it work? Well, you have to have the number of parameters more than the number of training data. That's what it makes in practice. And the more parameters we have, the easier it is to interpolate. Well, let's look at the number of parameters in some modern machine learning architectures. So each of this circle, this is from Kanziani et al., um, a paper which summarizes. This is kind of a summary of some of the modern architectures. The size of the circle, oh, you cannot see that. Um, in any case, the size of the each, each circle is an architecture. The size of the circle is the number of parameters. So the big one is about, uh, so the small one is about 5 million parameters, the big one is about 150 million parameters. So we're training these networks with 150 million parameters and we're training them on data sets with maybe 100,000 or 1 million data points. So there's tremendous flexibility in terms of our parameters. We can basically always interpolate. And that's in fact what um, the authors of that previous paper show. And now if you look at that quote I have before, and you kind of think, well, the best way to solve the problem from practical standpoint is to build a very big system, okay? And this is some of those big systems. So you build the big systems, you throw enough parameters on it, and okay, you can interpolate. And for some reason which we don't completely understand, it generalizes. Okay, so now, um, if you kind of take this together with the previous thing, you can say, well, how much advantage can we get from this? Well, le le let's, let's, you know, humor me and sort of let's think that this is really SGD, which gets this uh, benefit. Well, how much SGD would give you over GD? Well, let's think about it. SGD basically gives you all of n computational gain over GD, and GPU really gives you about 100 times increase if you, if you implement your model correctly over CPU, it can actually be even more. So altogether, this is for, say, data set with 1 million data points, you get acceleration of the order of something like 10 to the 5. So combined, SGD on GPU is about 10 to the 7, faster than gradient descent on CPU, right? Now what is 10 to the 7? Well, 10 to the 7 is about a second versus a year, right? a little bit less. It's a third of a year, approximately 10 to the 7 seconds. So it's one second versus about four months of computational time. And you know, we used to do this until recently. We really ran gradient descent on CPU. And of course, well, if you have 
if it's that much slower, you can never succeed on, on anything of reasonable size in any case. So that's, um, that's actually kind of acceleration, which is uh, sort of like the Moore's law type of thing. I mean, of the same scale. OK, so that's, um, that is um, one way to sort of take a view on what is happening in modern machine learning with that. Now, uh, finally, uh, I'll talk a little bit about how you can actually kind of use this perspective once you sort of believe that maybe interpolation is a good thing to do. What can you do with it? Well, it turns out you actually can really use it to build very efficient kernel machines, quite large scale and quite um, accurate. How do you do that? Uh, let me first very briefly give you, okay, this is one slide introduction to, you know, RBFs, kernel machines. Uh, so we have a kernel. A kernel is simply a function of two variables, say a Gaussian kernel. And basically what we would like, we would like to interpolate the data. So I'm putting this as constraint f of x i equals y i. And I'm minimizing the norm in some space corresponding to that kernel. I don't really want to discuss. This is a kind of a separate thing. This is called the reproducing kernel Hilbert space, and this has this beautiful mathematical theory. But uh, basically, the upshot is, and here is a nice thing, the solution has this extremely simple form. It's just a linear combination of kernels centered on my data points. And it's exactly the same as for Gaussian processes. And uh, you know, there are other things like that. And you can view this as minimum norm interpolation. Now, to find this coefficient, I simply need to invert a big matrix. And this matrix, the size of this matrix, is n by n, when n is the number of my training points. So if you would like to think about this, each entry of this matrix is if you have input points, well, data points x1 up to xn, the i's j's entry of this matrix is k of xi xj, which is a Gaussian, let's say. OK, so this is a beautiful kind of, there is a beautiful classical statistical and mathematical theory associated to this. And why is this a very nice thing? Well, for one thing, it's a convex, right? That problem that I showed is convex. It is analytically tractable, and in fact, it's just kind of matrix inversion, effectively. And also, you can view it as a two-layer neural network. So if you cannot even deal with that, uh, good luck you know, working with the things that I showed in the first slide. OK, so can we deal with this? Well, uh, actually, we cannot even explain why this thing generalizes. But we can make it faster. <laughs> you know, that's an engineering approach. <laughs> and it does work quite well. Uh, so how do we make it faster? Well, we use something like gradient descent. And of course, as I told you, gradient descent is terrible. Gradient descent, in this case, just has this, its matrix multiplication. It's called Richardson method or Landweber iteration. Again, it has these different names. But really, this is gradient descent. And you know, it's matrix multiplication. And really, instead of this, I need to use stochastic gradient descent. So how much gain do we have? And let's look at this. I'm, I don't want to sort of discuss this in detail, but what you can see is that for this method, m star, that critical number is 8. So if I have 1 million data points, doing gradient descent step is equivalent to doing a mini batch of size 8. So instead of 1 million, I'm doing 8. So it's 100,000 times acceleration for gradient descent for 1 million data points. It's, it's really crazy. It's, uh, it's an insane level of, uh, oh, you can say, OK, gradient descent is hopeless, if you want to think about it negatively. Uh, but uh, I prefer to think that the stochastic gradient descent is great. Um, so really, like, 8 is good enough. And so, OK, well, is a problem solved. So I take my kernel now. I want to make it fast. I take gradient descent of size 8, or stochastic gradient descent of size 8, and I can run it very quickly. Unfortunately, there is an issue here, is that 8 is too small. It's not really using my GPU. 8 
you, you don't want eight, you want 1,000 or maybe 5,000 to really feel the GPU. And how do you do this? Well, just to give you a very rough idea, you want to, it turns out you can modify the kernel and you can do some sort of spectral modification of the kernel and you make the first eigenvalue of the kernel smaller. And by making it smaller, you can force this critical size to grow actually up to a thousand or several thousand. So you can take much better advantage of the hardware. And this is kind of the idea. You take this, this as a spectrum of my original kernel. And what I'm doing, I'm kind of flattening it. So instead of my first eigenvalues being large, I may force my first k plus one eigenvalues to be quite small. And that really accelerates stochastic gradient descent. That makes um, the critical mini batch size much larger. So uh, let me just show you a couple of. Um, so, okay, I have to explain how to do this and why it makes sense. So I'm not going to go through the technical details. But let me uh, maybe just show you a couple of experimental results because I think it's quite interesting. So we have something like. Um, so th this are. Uh, pretty big data sets. Um, so this is uh, some sort of large version of a MNIST with uh, like six million data points. We're only using one million for this experiment. And um, we can do this on a single GPU. We can get a good result, which is kind of pretty cool. It's a little better, but similar to the best uh, for kernel methods. And we take 21 minutes of GPU time. Now, if you compare it to something which was done not so long ago, this is a paper like from 2016, right, two years ago, they get similar result. They take one hour on a 1,300 CPUs, on a parallel machine with 1,300 CPUs. So 20 minutes of GPU time versus 1,300 of CPU time. And the same thing here. Um, you know, well, we can do like full ImageNet, which is 1.3 million data points with uh, 1,000 classes. We can do it in 40 minutes and so on. By just doing this, basically like doing these tricks. And um, we can, um, well, again, this is like 17 minutes versus like seven hours of 1,000 CPUs. So this is a dramatic improvement in speed and also some improvements in accuracy. Because, well, uh, there is a reason. Speed is very much related to accuracy because, well, you can choose your parameters better. That's one thing, if it's faster. Second, you don't get tired of writing it, right? You know, like, if you run seven hours on 1,000 CPUs, you say, okay, well, look at the, you know, it's AWS, right? So the, the cache is sticking. <laughs> Maybe I should stop now. The result is pretty good. I don't want to spend another $1,000. And yeah, so that's basically uh, th that's the kind of improvement that you get from this. Um, and another cool thing is that once you kind of understand this, um, what controls the things, you can choose parameters automatically. So you actually get the parameters of the hardware of the GPU, and you can, from the formulas that I had before, choose the parameters for your optimization. So it's more or less automatic. Very little parameter selection is needed. Of course, you still have to choose a kernel parameter, but at least optimization is done uh, completely on its own. Takes care of itself. And another cool thing is that you can, for smaller data sets, like about, you know, like 50,000 or 100,000 data points, this takes seconds. You, you can do like uh, 100,000 data points in 15 seconds. If you use a kind of standard method, this takes hours, right? <laughs> so seconds versus hours allows you to deal with data much better. Okay. Now, let me maybe kind of wrap up the story, and then I'll be happy to, you know, answer any questions or you know, discuss anything. Um, so may maybe there are a couple of takeaway messages from all of this. And first, I think there is a, the kind of, you can think of the power of interpolation. I think we now have a pretty good explanation of why SGD is so fast in machine learning. This is not a complete explanation because, for example, this momentum type of things still need to be understood. Uh, but at the very least, you know, it explains the key phenomena which are happening.
And then the second thing is that it allows for much simpler analysis, at least in terms of optimization. So we really don't, we don't need the, once you believe that interpolation is good, right, you don't worry about the loss function. You can always just interpolate, right, that has no loss function. You don't really worry so much about regularization. There is not much regularization in interpolation, right, other than the choice of, so the shape of the kernel does something and that's about it. So really a lot of things kind of get removed, a lot of complexity gets removed. And uh, as a sort of application for it, we can build very efficient kernel machines which really adapt automatically to hardware. Now, uh, from the point of view of deep learning, I think it's the story now is also kind of clear, is that we have tremendous over-parameterization, this network with hundreds of millions of parameters, and that leads to interpolation, and that basically leads to faster GD and somehow Faster GD is just great on GPUs, and you know the wonderful hardware people gave us these amazing machines, which are like so much faster than anything which existed even like five years or ten years ago. The magic key that why it does it generalize as well, and the second point we have a neural network which we have not understood is why convolutional structures seem to be important. That's I think is a kind of orthogonal question to this but a really important one. Good. At least for images, it seems that all the good results come from convolutional structures. Uh, finally, I think from the point of view of understanding the fundamental phenomenon of interpolation, why do the classifiers generalize? And that's really, really, so I showed you maybe a little bit of in terms of the first steps toward. So at the very least, there are other methods with this kind of properties which generalize, but they're quite far. So we really need to understand this better. And there seems to be a ubiquitous phenomenon. I think all strong classifiers somehow have this. Like deep neural networks, kernel machines, random forest, other but they all have this. Uh, the interesting thing, I think, from this discussion is that generalization is probably not, at least in the main, determined by this list of things. It's not about non-convexity, since we see this for kernel machines, which are convex. And that's important because there have been a lot of attempts to somehow connect it to non-convexity, but it doesn't seem to be the case that that's the kind of determinant factor. It's not about regularization not about loss function or deep architectures, and probably not about specific properties of optimization algorithms either, because we can just do matrix inversion. There is no real optimization there at all. Just do matrix inversion, get 10 to the minus 27, one works just fine. All of the things probably have some influence, I mean surely have some influence, but they are not main factors. On the other hand, inductive bias is clearly important, and what do I mean by inductive bias? I mean that when you do your method, you have some sort of choice of your function space, and that clearly is important. Like uh, for a kernel, that would be like the choice of the kernel, or the kernel parameter. And I think it is really time to revisit high dimensional statistics and really rethink those things, and really the tools of approximation, or I should say high dimensional statistics and approximation, because that's, I think, the mathematical tools and statistical tools would really be, um, I think, extremely useful. And um, I'll stop at this point. Thank you. <laughs>